Good morning, everybody. I'm going to hand over straight away to the Commissioner General from UNRWA, who's been briefing member states here this morning and uh, is here to speak to you and obviously take questions. Uh, it's really good to have you here, um, Philippe Lazzarini, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for making for this uh, press briefing. Um, basically, I'm here in Vienna primarily for an official visit with the Austrian uh, government, uh, but Vienna being also a UN, the third UN headquarter, and also the, has been for 20 years the headquarter of the organization I'm heading, UNRWA, between 75 and 96, uh, we were present here. I felt it was also important to engage with uh, member states uh, to bring them a little bit up to speed to some of the challenges uh, UNRWA is confronted with. Uh, and uh, basically, I wanted to share uh, the same uh, with you uh, today. Maybe just to, to start, and I started my briefing also by reminding member states uh, how unique uh, within the UN system UNRWA is. Why? Because we are the only organization which is requested to provide direct public services to one of the most destitute community in the region, being the Palestinian refugees. In reality, we act as a ministry of education, we act as a ministry of primary health, we act as a ministry of social services, we act as a ministry of municipal services in the camp across the region. And when I say the region, it's in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, West Bank is Jerusalem, and uh, Gaza. For these activities, we have 20, uh, uh, 28,000 staff, which in terms of staffing, makes one of the biggest organizations within the United Nations uh, system. We provide services to nearly 550,000 girls and boys across uh, the region. That's the education part. We provide vocational training to about uh, 10,000 youth in uh, the region. We provide primary health services to 2 million uh, people in the region. We provide uh, municipal services in all our camps. Uh, and in addition of that, uh, like, and here it's like any other UN agency, we provide humanitarian assistance whenever there is a crisis. And today, the humanitarian assistance means we are, for example, providing food and cash assistance to nearly 2 million people, among them 1.2 million people only in the Gaza Strip. I was highlighting also this morning that we operate in five different areas, four of them being in a crisis. Lebanon, we all know, is a country which, is in, uh, which fall into a deep uh, financial, economic, and political crisis. In top of that, it's a country which is also impacted by the crisis in Syria, hosting more than one million Pal uh, Syrian refugees, in addition of the Palestinian refugees. Syria, you are all very familiar on the situation, 12 years uh, of a conflict, uh, which then has further compo been compounded by an unprecedented financial and economic crisis, but partly intertwined with the one of uh, Lebanon, and then also a country which has been unprecedentedly hit by the earthquake at uh, the beginning of the year. In uh, S Syria, uh, basically, uh, the entire Palestinian refugee community is rely on uh, UNRWA uh, assistance. Um, if you go to Jordan, Jordan is the only one which is not hit by the crisis as described before, except uh, that, like any other country in the region, they have severely been e hit economically by uh, the COVID, and uh, people are obviously are also uh, struggling. But the other two areas of concern for us uh, is the West Bank, uh, where confront Com, uh, uh, confrontation 
uh, with the uh, Israeli uh, security forces and Palestinian communities have significantly increased, number of incursions have significantly increased, uh, and uh, last year was the deadliest year uh, since uh, 2005 when it comes to the West Bank, and this year is certainly on track to be even deadlier than it was uh, last year. So big, big, big concern about uh, the situation in, uh, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And last but not least, Gaza, which I also described today as being a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a self-man-made humanitarian welfare society. Uh, you have an entire population uh, which today rely on food assistance, Whereas before the blockade uh, in 2050, uh, to, in uh, 2005-06, we had only 80,000 people who were relying on food assistance when it comes to Gaza. Now, in this context, uh, you know that our agency is very much associated to financial crisis, uh, but I keep uh, telling member states, please do not take it as a given our ability to continue to muddle through with the financial crisis. Our ability to continue to provide services is slowly but surely coming to an end. And if it comes to an end, what is at stake are all the activities I just mentioned before. Why are we in the situation in which we are in today? I believe that the financial crisis has started about 10 years ago, has started at the time the Israel-Palestinian conflict uh, started to be deprioritized when they have been emerging of new regional dynamic, global di dynamic, uh, competing crisis, uh, domestic uh, reason in a number of countries. And the combination of all this uh, has led to the stagnation of the resources of uh, UNRWA. I say stagnation because basically our resources today are very similar uh, uh, than the one we had in 2013. But between 2013 and today, this region has been hit by multiple crises. Uh, needs have significantly increased. Uh, we have been also confronted by soaring prices like anyone else uh, in uh, the world. But expectations from the communities have also increased, considering that UNRWA is their only lifeline. But the agency could not anymore deliver at the level of the expectation. And this tension between stagnating resources and increasing cost, increasing needs has year after year become unbearable for the organization. We are the only organization which operates today with a negative cash flow, uh, with uh, starting the year each time with important liabilities. When I was in New York, Last uh, week, uh, last week, two weeks ago, at the time of the donor uh, conference, uh, I was telling member states, please do not take any more our ability to go from one financial crisis to another one as granted. The situation is very serious. The agency has started, you know, if you metaphorically, you can say that a boat start to sink. We haven't sunk, but to prevent uh, the full sinking of uh, the agency, it requires uh, political mobilization and political will. Over the last two, three years, the agency has tried few tracks to, to, to overcome the situation in which we have been locked in. First has been to promote mutual agreement compact with member states. On one hand, we tell them this is what you can expect from the agency as a modern organization delivering services in line with our time, but we need more predictability from you increase your contribution, be more predictable. A predictable UNRWA should be in the interest of anyone in the region, because a predictable UNRWA promotes also the stability in a highly volatile region. This has, yielded, has ended by everybody agree with the strategy, the approach, but no increased contribution. Then we say, fine, so let's try another avenue. How can we partner? In the UN, United Nations DNA, partnership is very important. But the problem is that in the absence of a political horizon, political framework, 
partnering in the eyes of the community and the host country means handing over responsibility. Even if it is not, that's the way it is perceived. It fuels the feeling of a conspiracy. It fuels the feeling that the agency is uh, turning its back. To, and by weakening the agency, we also weaken the future right of the Palestinian refugees if there is no political framework. So this avenue has shown its limit. And the third avenue, we are an organization asked to provide proofs, but we are funded like an NGO. This does not function anymore. It has functioned for 60 years, but it does not function anymore since 10 years. So can we, yes or not, go through, assess the compulsory contribution of the member state, the same member state who provide to the agency the mandate? That was last November. We had discussion in New York. They have been a decision to slightly increase uh, the contribution, and this has not been the game changer uh, the organization was seeking. So today, we are in a situation where I do not have any visibility anymore beyond the months of September. I do not know what will happen in September, October, November. We have no indication of contribution. We have indication of big donors having told us that they will decrease their contribution to the organization at the time we need an increase. So our shortfall today is to survive till the end of the year, $150 million, to end the year without important liabilities, more than $200 million. And in addition, in addition, we need $75 million just to keep the food pipeline in Gaza beyond September, and $30 million for Syria and Lebanon. The $75 million of Gaza is critical. You might have heard recently that the World Food Programme had to significantly decrease its activities in the Gaza Strip and drop 200,000 beneficiaries. WFP and UNRWA provide food assistance to 75% of the entire population in uh, the Gaza Strip. And basically, we represent uh, the equivalent uh, of one meal a day for this 75 percent. So if WFP, which break down, and UNRWA also break down, at the same time, we would be confronted to our inability to pay our salaries, uh, we would be uh, exposed to a very explosive uh, situation in the Gaza Strip, since we are the main provider of uh, I would say, basic social services to this uh, community. So that has been also my call to the international community. Next year, we will mark the sales of an agency which was supposed to be a temporary agency. Uh, so nothing to celebrate about the duration, because that means the longest lasting unresolved conflict is still not resolved. And basically, to promote the sustainability of the agency, I have called for political willingness, attention, to ensure that in the absence of alternative, in the absence of a political solution, that we remain committed to the Palestinian refugees in the region through an agency like UNRWA. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Sir Philippe. Questions? Uh, please, yeah, the microphone's coming. <coughs> uh, François Murphy from Reuters. Um, I was just wondering if you could give, provide us a little more, uh, I mean, it all sounds quite bleak, uh, this fact you need $75 million just to keep the food pipeline going beyond September. Um, you were talking about partnering with other UN agencies. Uh, what, is the, what are the best prospects you have at the moment of filling this gap in funding? Even though, you know, even if you have become quite used to a cash shortfall by the end of the year. Yeah, thank you. Our, our natural partner, when it would come to food distribution or cash distribution, is the one who had now, because of uh, financial difficulties, to decrease uh, the number of beneficiaries from 300,000 to 100,000, so a drop of 200,000. Our best prospect is that uh, um, the, the main contributor and donor on uh, cash and food uh, 
uh, remain, uh, succeed uh, to remain committed and to process this $75 million. I'm still hopeful that this might happen, but we also know what the danger is all about. Now, more broadly, um, you know, I was highlighting the $150 million shortfall of the agency or longer sustainability. Uh, I do believe also that um, there are some prospects uh, coming from uh, the region and Gulf countries where I believe there is still room for them to increase and to be um, you know, further uh, committed and supportive of the agency. Thank you. Other questions? Please. Hello, thank you for being here first. My name is Clara, I come from EFE, and I wanted to know if you have some if you're working in some other projects, like small project di directed to <clears throat> this small group of people, of refugees, for example, any similar project that, as the one in Syria in adaptabilities of houses with people with disabilities? Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of what you have in mind, but if the question is related to uh, inclusion of uh, disabled, mm -hmm. Uh, indeed, uh, the agency has uh, developed a, a policy. We are still lagging behind. There is absolutely no doubt. We have also infrastructure which were built, uh, I would say, you know, in uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, which also uh, need to be adapted to promote uh, better inclusion. But this has become um, uh, 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 a focus also of the agency, especially when it comes uh, to promoting equal opportunities uh, for people with uh, disabilities within the organization. I don't know if that answers or not, but... Uh, yes. Okay. Please. Mm -hmm. My name is Sharif from Africa. Uh, my question goes about the cost of the agency, because before it was here. So do you think that the change of the place from Vienna to the West uh, Bank has affected that with, with the budget to come down, or there is, so that the organization could save money regarding, for example, the logistics, the offices, and the staff members? Listen, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, the move was in '95. Uh, if ju just to, to give you a few few facts, the agency with 28,000 staff uh, has 200 international, so 200 plus. Uh, so the ratio of international compared to national is certainly the smallest in the entire UN system. The international part. Uh, is a part which is funded uh, through assessed uh, contribution. But uh, the programs and uh, uh, um, part uh, of the agency is fully funded uh, by voluntary contribution. Now, the main reason of the move from uh, Vienna to uh, Gaza first, because the, head the headquarters went to Gaza, between Gaza and Amman, was of a political nature. It was uh, as a follow-up uh, of the Oslo Agreement, and uh, at the time, the Palestinian, uh, uh, the PLO, uh, uh, decided to be headquartered in Gaza. They requested also uh, UNRWA to be headquartered in uh, Gaza, and that's when the move has taken place. So the initial rationale was not necessarily of a budgetary rationale, but it was more of a political rationale. What I can tell you when it comes to the budget uh, is a few things. Number one, we are certainly the agency which, per, per, which spend the less per staff. Why? The comparator of our staff when it comes to the salary is not the other UN agencies, but it's the host country where we operate, uh, because most of our um, uh, employees uh, are in reality providing public-like services comparable to the host country. 
So we have about 20,000 teachers within the organization. The comparator for our teacher will be, in fact, the host country. Over the last 10 years, this agency has gone through multiple efficiency processes because of budget constraint, which since, I would say, 2014, started to become austerity measure to the extent today that the austerity is also impacting the quality of our services. We have gone, for example, over the last 10 years uh, from an, av an average uh, of 20 25 kids in our classroom in some field of operation to nearly 50. And you do not have the same quality of, uh, of uh, uh, education when you have 50 people in your classroom than when you have uh, 25. Uh, same with uh, health services. Today, the average time uh, a doctor or a nurse spend uh, for a consultation is three minutes, no more than that. And this is nothing else than the impact uh, of the austerity. And this is without counting uh, the fact that the agency has been totally unable to uh, to invest uh, in its modernization, in, uh, in, in the maintenance also of uh, some of our uh, important assets. And we keep also drawing the attention of the impact of this uh, to the member states. Thank you. I saw a question here at the front. Thank you very much, Turkish News Agency, Anadolu. You said you uh, you were two weeks ago in New York, and today here you addressed the member states. How uh, critical the situation, uh, the financial situation, what was the reaction of the member states? And uh, actually, I want to know what was the reaction of Muslim countries, first of all. Uh, second, uh, I guess one week ago, the uh, UN High Commissioner was also here. He was also not um, happy with the budget of UN High uh, thing, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking it is some kind of um, <clears throat> all UN institutions have such a financial problems, such a financial issues. What would you say to do? Thank you. Thank you. It, it is true that financial difficulties uh, hit most of the UN agencies nowadays because you have also a number of uh, who have uh, indicated that their overseas budget uh, will decrease uh, or you have a higher part of the overseas budget which might be affected to different type of uh, priorities depending on. We had a few years ago, do you remember, uh, the UK decided to go from 0.7 to 0.5 percent of the GDP. This had an important impact uh, on bilateral support uh, to number of UN agencies. Then you have also, you know, domestic consideration. I always, and I keep uh, seeing colleagues, uh, I always look with some anxiety, some outcome of uh, dom uh, domestic election because depending on the outcome, they will be more favorable or less favorable to some kind of uh, activities. Among them is uh, supporting UNRWA, uh, uh, the only agency providing uh, assistance to Palestinian refugees. So across the UN system, there is indeed a deep anxiety about the impact of resources available and our ability collectively to cover all the multiple crises, but also to fund, uh, to fund our commitment vis-à-vis -vis the broader Sustainable Development Goal agenda. Now, UNRWA's difficulties have been pushed to the extreme. And that was also a message in the, in, when I was in New York. I say, how do you want me to decide that because I have 20% less resource, that I have to ask 20% of the kids in our school who are enrolled for the next 10 years to drop out of the school because of the absence of this 20%. It's an impossible choice to be made. Uh, when you are enrolled. Um, public services or, 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 or institutions are not necessarily confronted to this uh, situation, especially when it comes to education. So 
the impact of the underfunding in an organization like ours uh, is far much different uh, than in other contexts which would just prevent uh, the realization of a given project or program or not covered as a need, but certainly not uh, to undertake, I would say, you know, where our, our, our main impact is human development. And all of a sudden you will say, well, continue human development, but not for 20% of the people you, you used to invest in. So there is a high risk to reverse all this. And uh, in the ecosystem where we operate, if we drop 20% in one field, the rest of the field will also react and push back on this kind of situation. So that's the difficulties we are confronted with, basically. Any real transformation is almost impossible to undertake in the absence of a political framework, political di dialogue, political horizon, because otherwise it will be seen and perceived as an attempt to weaken the first, uh, future right of uh, the Palestinian refugees. Now, I do believe that the message in New York has been well understood. Number of member states have acknowledged the urgency of having this kind of a discussion. Most of the member states uh, have highlighted that there is no real alternative in this situation to the organization, have highlighted how irreplaceable it is, and I hope that this will trigger, you know, this uh, last-minute mobilization of uh, resource. But at the same time, the resource is not enough per se. We really have to agree on how do we make this organization predictable and sustainable. I, I believe that predictability for every actor in the region, it would be a plus to know what we can expect from the agency. And we are primarily a human development agency for the time being. Any prospect from the region? I, again, uh, I think there is, there is some room for you know, improvement. OK. Any final questions? Doesn't look like it. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Commissioner General. Thank you.